Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I thank the organizers of this very important series of webliners for inviting me to contribute uh, to uh, this program. And I particularly thank Professor Hamad Arthur, uh, Senior Professor in Urology at the Aga Khan University for his kind uh, invitation. So my topic today is uh, prevention and the management of complications of PCNL, which I think is a very important topic that we all should uh, be aware of. So as you know, pre-CNL has now grown to be a, a very frequently performed operation. And in my personal view, every endourologist and every urologist should be competent uh, in doing basic uh, PCNL. Uh, and it is important, especially for those of us who live and work uh, in the areas of the stone belt, which you know is spread across uh, uh, near the equator uh, on the globe. And because of the large numbers of PCNLs that are carried out across the globe, you would be uh, aware that even a modest improvement in the incidence of its complications and morbidities uh, would translate into a significant benefit uh, to patients. So I'm going to quote extensively from uh, some of the larger studies and global studies that have been done uh, with regards to PCNL. And as you know, thanks to advancements uh, in the knowledge and the technique of the operation, which has been revised, uh, refined uh, quite significantly in the last decade or two, complications of this operation are quite, quite infrequent now. Of the recorded ones, infections, Bleeding are the common uh, events, followed by perforation of viscera, sepsis, and failure to complete the procedure on very occasional uh, situations. We are also fortunate that the overall mortality following PCNL uh, is, uh, uh, is, remains at a very low level, uh, which uh, is encouraging as this is an elective operation and we do not want to see uh, significant mortality associated with elective surgery. So let me start uh, by discussing uh, sepsis following PCNL. You know this already that about 10% of patients following uh, percutaneous nephrolithotomy develop some degree of infection, which often uh, settles with appropriate antibiotics. However, of this 10%, about a 10 to 40% proportion of this group that develops uh, infection can develop life threatening sepsis. Now, this is what I'm going to talk, uh, talk about. And you know that sepsis uh, can be detected uh, with the presence of uh, various signs, suggestive systemic uh, inflammation and sepsis, as uh, denoted here. And the clinician, as well as the anesthetic team or the critical care team, must be very watchful uh, for any of these uh, features which should uh, indicate that the patient has turned septic, which requires urgent uh, treatment and intervention. Now, the common risk factors that are cited in literature as um, risk factors for sepsis includes positive preoperative urine cultures. You know that stones can be associated with infections in both ways. Uh, as infections can cause stones, which is less frequent now, and also obstruction associated with stones can cause infection. So it is important in both directions. And the other factors associated with sepsis uh, with PCNL include the treatment of larger stones, larger than 25 millimeters, long operating times, more than, more than an hour or two, uh, the need for multiple tracks, uh, and blood transfusions. So Whenever these risk factors are encountered, the clinician must be extra careful. Additionally, uh, it is also speculated that previously hydronephrotic kidneys and diabetes uh, may have some degree of correlation with post-operative sepsis following PCNL. So we need to be aware of these factors and especially with preoperative cultures, uh, it is important that Antibiotics uh, are administered and the cultures are negated or you have you achieve negative cultures and also uh, inflammatory markers 
uh, should be uh, at a low level uh, sometimes when there has been preoperative sepsis uh, and there has been a stent or a drain inserted when the stone is in situ these markers do not come to baseline uh, that quickly until the stone is treated but they must come to reasonably low levels and remain stable without any uh, organisms growing in the culture before the surgeon embarks on surgery. They must receive uh, therapeutic antibiotics following surgery, uh, even when the cultures are negative and markers, uh, inflammatory markers are low, which uh, is a key factor in preventing sepsis after surgery. Another factor uh, which is important for us to bear in mind, we all have got used to uh, using uh, minimal drains following PCNL because of enhanced expertise. I'll talk about that in a moment. But in the instance of the risk factors being present, which I've already enumerated, it is imperative that a drain is always placed uh, after surgery. And this drain could be a stent that is inserted or a nephrostomy that is placed, whichever it might be uh, the surgeon's choice. But it is important to avoid tubeless procedures, especially totally tubeless procedures, in these high-risk categories following PCNL. I've already stressed the importance of early diagnosis of sepsis and the high index of suspicion needed by the clinical team for early diagnosis and active intervention when sepsis does occur. Now, let us also consider the development of sepsis in patients who are at low risk or where you do not perceive that there is a significant issue where the patient can become septic after surgery. In such situations, the clinician must always think differently outside the box, whether we have missed anything. And often we miss these events following surgery. So is there a small fragment that has fallen to the ureter in your tube, tubeless surgery, which is now causing obstruction leading to sepsis? Has there been an occult focus of sepsis, maybe through a closed calyx? Uh, or uh, some sepsis that has been uh, dormant within the stone, which has now flared up? Has there been extravasation? It's very important following tubeless PCNL or an inadvertent perforation. Now, visceral perforation, especially bowel injury, can manifest as uh, uh, occult sepsis or, or the development of sepsis following surgery. And all these uh, factors must be borne in mind with a high degree of suspicion to uh, diagnose and treat them. And don't forget that despite best efforts, we can have a breach of sterility because uh, if you do prone PCNL or supine PCNL, there's a lot of instrumentation, staff, positioning involved. So uh, we need to uh, be realistic that occasionally there can be breach of sterility, which can also cause inoculation of organisms into the system during surgery, which can make the patient very septic. So high quality of imaging uh, often diagnoses most of these problems and uh, CT is often best. And if you find any of these uh, problems, then you need to intervene accordingly. Uh, and then of course, manage the patient in a high dependency, um, high dependency environment with the appropriate antibiotics to control the situation. Now, let me get on to bleeding. Well, uh, significant bleeding in, in global uh, studies or international studies have been found to be around 78%. But there's a vast variation. It can sometimes uh, go up to 18 to 20 percent in some series. And of course, reported uh, at a much lower level in certain other series. Now, the overall transition rates that have been uh, reported range from 5 to 18 percent. And I'm sure you'll agree that uh, clinicians have uh, uh, a tendency to sometimes uh, be, a more, uh, be, be more eager to transfuse. And some of these patients may not actually not have required blood transfusions. Now, bleeding can be triggered at all different steps of this operation, whether it be puncture, dilatation of the tract, stone fragmentation, uh, retrieval, or instrumentation. So let me take you very quickly through these steps and as to how uh, we may provoke bleeding and also how we can avoid these complications during different steps uh, of the operation. So you're familiar with the pelvic aliceal anatomy of the kidney and you know that it is subject to significant variation. But what is a constant is that there are arterioles and uh, blood vessels that are very tightly woven around the caliceal necks. So during puncture, 
if your needle and your track goes through the caliceal neck, the chances of damaging these blood vessels, especially arterioles, are significant. You know that despite our best knowledge and uh, technique, PCNL is pretty much a blind operation, although we use ultrasound or X-ray to guide us into the relevant calyx uh, or the anatomy that we require to get into. Uh, there is a lot of uh, vasculature that we uh, transgress uh, during this operation, and it is not difficult, especially for the not-so-experienced clinician, to go through the caliceal necks, as you see in the uh, in the image or the diagram uh, in the middle, and this can lead to significant bleeding, uh, which will be a problem. So appreciate the caliceal anatomy, the angulation of the kidney, and also the fact that the caliceal phonesis, once again as depicted in these images and diagrams, are less vascular. So if we train ourselves to puncture through caliceal phonesis through experience and, and various uh, short series uh, of articles that are published, you know that the incidence of uh, bleeding can be less. So don't also forget that uh, an overzealous puncture uh, and an advancement of the needle beyond your target, that is basically where you go beyond the calyx and you go deep, you know that this is there can be a lot of optical illusions when you use uh, uh, imaging uh, and you think you're in one place, but you're actually not because you operate in a 3D field using 2D imaging. And if you go and hit a central vessel, a larger branch of the artery or the main artery, this, there can always be ter torrential hemorrhage. And you need to be very careful that you do not um, extend your needle uh, or your track uh, beyond the absolute point of entry. So another problem with a suboptimal puncture that goes through the calyx is that when the tract is dilated, uh, you enter with your scope into the pelvic calyceal system, once again, as you can see in this diagram, at an angle. So invariably to guide yourself and the nephroscope into the relevant anatomy that you uh, require uh, to visit for stone fragmentation and instrumentation may involve some degree of shearing. Now, I've tried to diagrammatically represent this in the, the, the slide that you see here. So if you enter at an angle to align yourself with the, uh, the calyx, you need to shear or you need to talk your scope and the tract, and this can result in tearing of the renal parenchyma. So this is another important reason uh, for you to do a, a, a puncture in line with the calyx, as seen in the green diagram or the green line, and also through the caliceal phonics, which gives you in-line access to the calyx through a relatively bloodless field and also avoids shearing or tearing of the renal parenchyma. Another thing we can uh, do to prevent surgery uh, soon after puncture is over distension of the pelicalis system. Your assistant, once again, if he's too enthusiastic in giving you a nicely dilated system to puncture, can sometimes, out of enthusiasm, over distend the system, uh, which uh, causes a lot of pressure on the vessels around it. And, and upon decompression after puncturing, uh, just like uh, any other part of the urinary system, can have reactionary bleeding. So over distension should be avoided and non-anatomical punctures uh, going through caliceal necks or uh, uh, extending uh, your puncture or your needle beyond uh, the minimum target uh, should be carefully avoided. So let me now get on to tract dilatation. Uh, tract dilatation uh, can also cause bleeding and it could be the aggression with which you dilate uh, or the, the, the size of the tract that you uh, use, or sometimes just like the needle, overshooting uh, your point of entry where you go deeper into the parenchyma, or sometimes even the hilum where the, the dilators can damage uh, more central structures which are more vascular with larger vessels, which can cause significant bleeding. Now, we know that size matters here. And again, uh, Jamaguchi uh, in the Journal of Endurology uh, uh, published uh, his findings of the correlation between tract size uh, and the risk of bleeding. Now, these are all estimates, but you see that as the tract size falls below 24 range, the incidence of bleeding drops drastically. Similar with the tract size uh, going beyond uh, 24 to 26. So my personal preference for even large stones and staghorns is 24. And uh, again, personally, I have found that 
the incidence of bleeding with a 24 size uh, track is much less. I know there are many proponents of smaller tracks uh, using mini PCNL, even for large stones. So it's a matter of check technique. And uh, some of these techniques are called the Chinese PCNL, commonly practiced uh, in the Asian subcontinent where you use a small track, uh, a very wide space within this small track for free flow of irrigation out from the kidney and the use of a mini perk with laser uh, for efficient stone fragmenting. Now, whilst I emphasize the importance of choosing track size to minimize bleeding, I must also stress on another thing. Now, you don't primarily choose the track size only for the reduction of bleeding. So what I'm trying to say is that you use uh, your knowledge of this to optimize the track size, but the size of the tract is often determined by the size of the stone. So larger stones, uh, according to the preferred technique, might require larger tracks, and also to fit uh, your instrumentation. And there's a wide variation in your uh, in the personal preference of surgeons with regards to equipment. So you might need to fit your equipment uh, to an appropriate track, and also match the track uh, to the stone size, also the caricial anatomy. Having considered all that, always try to use the smallest possible and smallest track appropriate for the surgery that you are doing. So that is my message here. It's not a blind or a, or a automatic decision that you are just going to use an 18 French track or a 26 or a 27 French track. So try to use the smallest possible track appropriate for that particular operation. So that's my message to you. And also in dilatation, slow is sometimes fast. So dilate slowly gently without aggression, use the appropriate track and make sure that when you retrieve stones, you do it as gently as possible. Your irrigation must be of sufficient pressure but not too high to cause irritation and blood uh, bleeding. Uh, we must not pull stones through narrow caliceal necks aggressively because we know there are blood vessels just outside and if you tear the calices, there can be bleeding. Uh, so all these uh, factors are important and also avoid uh, over distension and uh, the, the, if you use lithoplast for uh, surgery or even with uh, high powered laser, avoid perforation of the KLC system because just, just outside that you have blood vessels, uh, wherever it might be within the collecting system and perforation can lead to bleeding. So these are some of the preventable causes. Just to summarize, puncture through K, do, avoiding puncture through caliceal necks, avoiding overshooting, avoiding over dilatation, avoiding angulation, uh, or, or thereby going through the caliceal phonics, of course, uh, and using inappropriate or disproportionately large tracks or sheets um, over distension and aggressive lithotripsy and stone retrieval are highly preventable causes of bleeding during TCNL. And uh, we have actually outlined this in uh, a recent text in which uh, I was uh, uh, fortunate or privileged to contribute a few chapters. And uh, I welcome you to access this either online uh, or buy it through Amazon. Uh, I think it's a very good uh, guide to practical stone management published by OSTEC or Asian Urology Training and Education Group, which is an Asian-based training forum for uh, young surgeons. So now when bleeding does occur, don't forget arterial versus ble uh, venous bleeding. Now venous bleeding uh, is more frequent, fortunately, and can easily be controlled with good uh, irrigation. And if necessary, a tamponade catheter. And that's uh, what you see here is what I use, uh, uh, a Foley catheter, often 18 or 16, uh, with an inflated balloon. And I use uh, uh, dilute contrast. Uh, so that I know exactly uh, how can I can guide my balloon to the, the relevant place. And I, I, I clip off the tip of the catheter so that that does not go and irritate uh, the point uh, below the or beyond the balloon. So you can use uh, judicious nephrostomies, uh, tamponade catheters, panic semic acid is uh, uh, sometimes useful. And of course, in such situations, uh, we should not pursue uh, lithotripsy and stone retrieval, if there's torrential bleeding, you need to stop, come out with uh, tamponade catheters and various other means. And then when the bleeding settles, we can always revisit uh, the, the kidney with the, the same tract uh, in most instances. And you, uh, you find that after a day or two, you have a remarkably uh, clear 
field which allows us to complete the operation. It is very infrequent, but when bleeding does occur, uh, you need to bail out uh, and then save the kidney as well as the patient. And of course your reputation and then revisit the kidney uh, to do further lithotripsy at a later date. Arterial bleeding is different, you know this. Arterial bleeding often presents after about a week uh, following surgery. And uh, these are often pseudoaneurysms uh, or false aneurysms, uh, as we call it. And sometimes arteriovenous fistulae. And I've just tried to put a clip here. And uh, you need to have a very good relationship with your interventional uh, radiologist. And uh, ideally do complex PC and leading centers uh, only when there's interventional facilities are available. So uh, here you see a large uh, false aneurysm uh, and that is being, that is being uh, embolized selectively uh, through coils. So the incidence is fortunately less than 2% again in most published series, but early detection. So if a patient comes to you with significant bleeding, clot retention, uh, a week or two following surgery, you need to always consider this. So the first point in the diagnosis is a CT renal angiogram, which uh, gives you a clear diagnosis. And if you find that there is a, 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 an arterial bleeding or an AV fistula or a false aneurysm, then interventional management is the best. And this saves the kidney and certainly the, the surgeon's reputation and relieves the patient of a lot of anxiety um, with this very quick procedure, which is uh, efficiently done in the hands of experts. So I'm going to come on to visceral injury. According to literature, pleura and colon are the most frequently injured uh, organs uh, around the kidney. And not surprisingly, uh, with our basic anatomy knowledge, we know that uh, pleura is, and, and the colon, of course, is closely associated with the kidney. So it is not surprising that uh, a mistargeted puncture or a dilatation can injure these organs. There is a reported overall incidence of less than 3%, which once again is a reasonably good statistic. But remember that despite all precautions, we can always get caught to a retrorenal colon in about 0.7% or less than 1% of situations. And previous open surgery on the kidney or previous uh, surgery, even sometimes on the colon, can uh, cause this uh, uh, retrorenal positioning of the colon. And sometimes, of course, it is uh, congenital. Um, uh, where due to anatomical aberrations. Now, you'd appreciate that pleural injuries are more likely in upper pole punctures, as once again the diagram uh, depicts, and there's, there's no magic in that. If you go near the pleura, you are likely to puncture it. If you don't go near the pleura, you're less likely to puncture it. So I adopt this policy of trying to approach the kidney uh, whenever possible through the lower or mid pole, but of course, sometimes, uh, upper pole puncture is absolutely necessary. And in such instances, I do it with great caution. So the relationship of the pleura to the diaphragm and the lung uh, is not just the same. The pleura is lower down in a more medial position. Whereas uh, in a lateral position, even if you go along the rib, you find you know that the pleura curves up. So if you do need to do an upper pole or a transcostal puncture, always try to adopt a very lateral point of entry, which will reduce uh, the risk of pleural injury. Of course, my own technique is to talk the kidney. I just puncture the gerotus fascia lower down with a needle. And then under radiological CM guidance, I bring the, uh, I, I talk the kidney down with the needle so that I bring it below the pleura to gain access to the upper pole. Uh, this has already been published by numerous workers from India and the region. So talking the kidney is another way of keeping well below the pleura. <clears throat> so, before I finish, I'd like to again give you some significant uh, points that we can carry home as messages. And this I'm quoting through the Global PCNL study. Uh, which is a large study involving more than 25,000 patients uh, and done in more than 20 countries. If I remember right, so it is a very large study, which is published in different uh, sections or different topics 
uh, between 2011 and 2015. And the key findings of this uh, multi-center study is that position, whether it's prone to pine uh, or anything in between, does not make a significant difference in the incidence of morbidity of PCNL. However, for staghorns, they found that the morbidity is less and the incidence of uh, residual stones are less in the prone position. Now, this was done a couple of years ago. Uh, supine PCNL advanced and our experience with supine PCNL has uh, been uh, much more since then. So uh, I would not be surprised if this statistic is less relevant now. Certainly, the technique of dilatation has not been found to be associated statistically uh, in a statistically significant manner. So whether you use uh, Alcon or Amplats or the balloon dilator, uh, the studies have not found a major difference. So it's a matter of personal choice and what works best in your hands. Now, we can't always adopt uh, statistics and articles for our practice because there are certain things uh, that work better in our hands. So if something works in uh, your, your own technique better, then you should not give it up. Of course, the type of fragmentation device, whether it's pneumatic, ultrasound, or laser has also once again, through large studies and, and meta-analysis, have not shown a major difference between one to the other. However, the uh, use of antibiotics, uh, the puncture through supracostal uh, region, the tract size, obesity, diabetes, CKD, and single kidney have demonstrated significant differences in the morbidity profile of patients. So if you come across patients uh, who uh, have not uh, had antibiotics therapeutically, or if you have uh, come across, or if you come across these, uh, these uh, particular instances, always remember that the likelihood of uh, having a morbidity uh, would be much, uh, much greater. And I have, I have once again uh, gone through these uh, topics um, during my previous slides. So these are various points of wisdom that I've acquired through my interaction with the experts, attending various forums, and of course, uh, learning through the hard way. And one is that often we find that it's not the needle puncture that causes visceral injury. So when it comes to visceral injury, we may be puncturing more viscera than we diagnose. For that matter, it is not even the wire. It is the dilatation. So you may puncture into colon or you may puncture into pleura. Or you may put a guide wire and you know this happens very frequently. You even put wires into the IVC sometimes, but that doesn't do much. But if you dilate into that locality that you think has gone through, which is not your anatomical spot and you've gone through that, it's the dilatation that harms. Similarly, uh, I personally believe, I know there is a very large, uh, uh, significant number of people who do routine supracostal puncture. And uh, so I, I salute them and I respect them. But in my own practice, I, I believe that avoiding the supracostal uh, region for puncture and dilatation avoids injury. And that is obvious, but it's a matter of uh, preference. Using biplanar imaging, so both in the 90 degree or the 30 degree as well as across uh, horizontally across the, the body is a personal choice for me uh, when I use C-arm for PCNL and biplanar imaging using the C-arm uh, can really save you when you are close but not in. And so use uh, your technique, I'll show it with my hand in one uh, direction as well as uh, perpendicularly opposite because in both images you are at 90 degrees, if you find that your needle is absolutely in the position that you uh, to uh, that you need to get in. It is very unlikely that uh, your target is wrong. So, if you have a problem with access and if you are not sure, use biplanar. Most importantly, ladies and gentlemen, PCNL is an elective operation. If you are in trouble, if there is bleeding, if there is any visceral injury, stop. It is an elective operation. You need to stop. You need to drain. You need to control the problem. Come out. Speak to colleagues get more help, especially for our younger colleagues, is an important message. There's always another way and another day. But if you persevere with a difficult situation, whether it be bleeding or any other anatomical challenge, uh, you can put your patient at risk. And by doing so, you put your reputation at risk. So remember, there's always another way and another day with PCNL. So I leave you with this very important uh, quote from Hippocrates. 
uh, Hippocrates that you are very familiar with, uh, and it is very relevant to PCNL that we should first do no harm. Thank you very much, gentlemen.